I, uh, that's a great question because the day that I had to leave the classroom, I boohooed and cried in front of my students and parents. It was the most extreme separation anxiety, but I also, and my students helped motivate me to do this, but they realized that the impact that I had on their lives as they were about to graduate was said, Mr. Williams, you can do this with so many other students if you just become a school principal. I went to grad school, partly because my wife said my salary wasn't gonna cut it, but two, my students were basically like, like you have changed my life, Mr. Williams. And, and there are kids that need you. Imagine if you could do the same thing you did with us in a band room for an entire school. And I did. I went and got my master's degree and I became a principal for like three months. And because I'm a black man in a suit who's confident, I was quickly elevated to like associate superintendent slash, well, senior director of a smaller school district. That was really interesting. It was, it was not what I thought it was going to be. A smaller a school district? Warren County Schools. Yeah. Warren County, okay. I'm in a suit more, um, further away from the kids. I'm getting paid more, and I'm finding less purpose in my work. I just could not do it anymore. So uh, mm. when I got the call to uh, work at a healthcare, a behavior healthcare company, they basically paid me a good amount of money to just create curriculum, which was what my skill set was in. So I created a school concept, and I tested it in two of the lowest performing schools in Durham in after school programs. And these kids performed. And I was like, wow, I'm on to something here. I word got to the Department of Public Instruction and that's when I got a call being recruited to take on a bipartisan policy that would be the statewide. I did that for about a year and a half. And my wife, she left her job as a restaurant general manager. She needed help because her catering, she started catering from home and it got so popular. But I would have to leave the governor's office, go deliver a catering, and come back to Raleigh. And, <laughs> and I was doing a lot of that. And this is not it. This is not going to work. Uh, I retired and ended up opening the restaurant. And that's when my life really changed. Th- that that role before you before you retired, it is it sat, you said bipartisan. Like so, was this like a political role even at that point, or how would you describe that role exactly? Yeah, I was a political consultant. So there was this new policy that came to North Carolina introduced by the Republicans called the Achievement School District. Uh, The Democrats wanted to give it a shot. Uh, They didn't want to enact the actual Achievement School District, but they did want to look at what that policy allowed uh, charter schools to do and to see if we could enact that same flexibility for school leadership for public schools. So I was the one that uh, generated the data uh, to identify the bottom 5% of schools it was myself and Dr. Terrence Ruth, who was at the time the general, the uh, executive president, uh, the executive director for the state NAACP uh, for North Carolina. It was he and I, and we were like Democrats, basically. And then there were two Republicans that were involved, and then the actual assistant, the uh, superintendent of the actual innovative school district, which is what they renamed it to. So three Republicans, two Democrats working on this policy, and we traveled the state. I noticed that when we were going into schools, it was being sort of marketed as a school takeover. And said, no, that's not, that's not what I'm here to do. Uh, but we realized that Phil Berger was actually, in fact, trying to utilize this. It was a really sneaky thing to do. It sounded the alarm, and that's when I just resigned. I said, I can't be a part of this. And my boy, Terrence, he, he resigned also. Uh, the Republicans took that and they just evolved. They, actually, they dissolved it, I believe, or it may still be around, I don't know. But they just went, they went haywire with uh, creating solutions to things that were not a problem uh, in education, and it's only getting worse. But I went on to resign and I retired, uh, opened the restaurant. So so the the restaurant, are we talking about Zueli's on 15501? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so your your wife already had a catering business before you actually resigned. When did the restaurant first become like an a realistic pursuit? Was it was it while you were still working? Like when when did the restaurant actually come into play? Cuz I don't you don't just open up a restaurant. <laughs> Yeah, so my wife and I both had a catering business. So basically, she was catering uh, while I was working at the, in Raleigh. Uh, we lived in Durham County, but right there on the line by Broad Creek. I remember we catered a wedding in Pittsburgh. And then uh, the, the person who owned the, the venue put us in touch with a few hotels in Chapel Hill. So we ended up catering for the Hampton Inn and Suite, two of their properties. And somehow uh, the NAACP called and we catered their conference. It was 600 people for breakfast, 600 for lunch. And this was two days in a row. It's like, whoa, we're getting, we're getting like catering gigs that are way too much for us to handle. We need a location. So we started looking for a catering kitchen. Mm. 
And every time we tried to get a, we found a spot and we tried to get a loan and we just couldn't, kept getting denied. We were getting denied because we were, it was the restaurant industry was too risky or we were considered unbankable or yeah, we have the credit score, but we've never had a business before. So we need a higher credit score, close to the 800. But the requirement was 720 and we had a 726. We, we were asking for $180,000 loan, uh, a loan for 180. And they said, well, you need to have 50% of it as you have to show that you have 50% of the loan amount you're asking for. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, all right. So we didn't have that. So we asked for help. So we had some money wired to us and we went in the next day to the bank. So, all right, we have the, uh, the, the, uh, the money here, the 90K, they said, well, how did you get it so fast? Oh, well, we got international support. Our, our parents live in Zimbabwe. Oh, international money. That's a little too risky for us. We're not going to go for it. But we mm. got all types of excuses, man. <clears throat> we, were, we were denied like seven times. And Complete. I'll never forget. I'll tell you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, man. The night, like we ended up, so that's why I took out my retirement. I, I was frustrated. I kept being told no. No, no, no. And I just felt like every time someone told me no, and if I was to accept that, I was basically being okay with someone telling me how they think my life should be outlined. And that is the worst thing you can do to me. I'm just too competitive for that. So I looked online, I looked at the implications of retiring, the early fees, and all that stuff. And I said, well, they're just going to have to tax me. Give me my money. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? This is the money you're supposed to use when you're old and gray and that I have to give me the money. Mm -hmm. And it was $26,000. We had 10000 from uh, saved up from catering. So we had 36000 Basically, uh, I went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of wood and a bunch of paint. We called two of my friends in and her mom flew from Zimbabwe. And the father of us, when we found this location, this guy said, hey, forget the bank. Just sign the paper. It was a bad deal, but we signed it. <laughs> that was the one on 15 follow one. Mm -hmm. um, he said, you got three months rent free. After that, you got to pay 11000 a month. We, uh, yeah, man, we did everything we could. We learned how to paint.